So good morning, everybody, and a really warm welcome from me to Accelerate Gov, the conference for everything digitalization and transformation across the public sector. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here in person um, back in the room, but I would also like to say a big hello as well to everybody who is joining us on our live stream today. And I will remember to keep touching base, saying hi to the people on the live stream throughout the day as well. I'm Siobhan Benita, I'm a former UK civil servant, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's conference on behalf of Global Government Forum, which creates safe spaces for civil servants all around the world to share ideas and their experiences. And we'll hear a little bit more about what GGF uh, does in our second keynote today. I'd like to thank everybody as well from the Government of Canada who have also, just to say, for sustainability reasons, we've tried to be as paperless as possible. So all the details about our speakers and the agenda can be found on our website as well. We've also got a photographer present today. If you don't wish to be photographed, please do make that known to the photographer or to one of us in the GGF team, and we'll make sure that you're not captured in any of the images but you all look so wonderful here today that it would be great to get as many of you as possible uh, in our pictures. Um, in addition to uh, such a great range of fabulous public sector speakers today, we also have some excellent knowledge partners with us from the private sector, including MNP Digital, Intel, Zscaler, DXC Technology and Skyhive. And some of their people will be sharing their expertise with us on some of the panels throughout today. But you can also, and please take the opportunity to do this, chat with them and our exhibition partners uh, during the breaks throughout today. We have a hashtag for those of you that like social media, uh, might want to go on Twitter today, share the excitement of the conference. It's just hashtag AccelerateGov. And finally, before I hand over to Stephen Burt, who is Canada's Chief Data Officer, to give the land acknowledgement today, I'd just like to remind you all that this is very much your day. It's very much your conference. So please, now we're all back together and we can do it. Please engage as much as possible. Please get involved in all the discussions. Uh, for about seven months now, uh, working on Captain Guele's team, I'm pleased this morning to be doing the, uh, the land acknowledgement before we begin. Nous faisons des reconnaissances des territoires pour montrer notre respect pour la terre, une tradition qui remonte à des siècles pour les peuples autochtones. La reconnaissance des territoires est un petit mais important pas vers la réconciliation. Today I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather as the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin people have lived in this land for, since time immemorial. We honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory and uphold and uplift the voice and values of our host nation. Nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir l'occasion d'être présents sur ce territoire et nous devrions tous, à notre façon, prendre des mesures pour protéger notre terre. I invite you to reflect on the impact of the people that were living on this land before you and to think of the actions you can take to preserve it for future generations. Avec ça, j'ai le grand plaisir de uh, faire le bienvenu à ma patronne, Madame Catherine Luello. Catherine is a Deputy Minister at the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat and the Chief Information Officer of Canada. Prior to her appointment in July 2021, she was the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer at Air Canada and has held a number of positions in major companies such as Enbridge, WestJet, and TELUS. Please join me in welcoming Catherine to the stage. Bon matin, bonjour, and ocean since COVID started. Okay, that's pretty good. How many want to go over the ocean now? Okay, very good. My little bit of my inner airline thanks you for that. There are participants and speakers from over 50 public service organizations and agencies from around the world. Many colleagues from the Government of Canada are joining in person. And I think we've got several hundred of you joining online, uh, both locally and internationally. Today's a very timely agenda. 
with many conversations on digitization, service transformation, and developing talent, all things that I know are top of our mind. An event like this is an opportunity for us to share knowledge, ideas, and have one plus one plus one equal 10. So I encourage you to have uh, those conversations and oftentimes some of the best conversations at these conferences happen outside these doors. So I'm pleased actually to have the opportunity this morning to talk to you about our digital ambition from a, gov from a Government of Canada perspective. In August, we launched this and we were a, a little bit of a backdrop. Um, we were having some service challenges uh, in the government and so it was a really appropriate time for us to share the accumulation of, of many months of work which really talked about how digitization of government um, could improve service to Canadians and ultimately lead to more trust, transparency and support of democracy. Our ambition statement is very sim simple. To enable the delivery of government in the digital age for all Canadians. That means leaving no Canadians behind. How we're going to do this, all of the data we have as government and use that collectively, all of the data we have as government and use that collectively, respecting privacy, respecting security, making sure Canadians understand what we're using their data for to inform better policy, better programs and better program delivery. Action ready digital strategy and policy. Very specifically, we've renamed our policy team, policy and performance. It's no longer good enough to develop policy. You need to make sure that it's implemented and we're going to be spending a lot of time. And that means going out and living with the teams that have to implement the policy. So that's something very, very top of my mind. And as someone who's had the privilege to run wide scale, time sensitive operations working in both the energy sector and in the aviation sector, uh, that's the lens uh, that we're trying to bring to the conversation. And the final uh, pillar of our strategy is structural evolution in funding, talent, and culture. And I think all of our organizations are probably struggling with that right now. So I'm really hopeful that uh, the, the Team Canada can come back with some great suggestions from all the different geographies that are here today to help us advance that. That's, to me, the foundational pillar of our overall plan. Digital government in a, in a modern age is kind of not a choice anymore. And you think about the progression that's happened during COVID, um, you know, your digital agenda brought to you by COVID is a thing that's happened with businesses globally, but certainly from a digital transformations are radically transforming the way we live, work and interact. Citizens are looking for government to lay the path towards secure and reliable, private, user-centric. And so um, when I talk to the team about digital ambition, we talk about open government, privacy, and security as sort of those foundational components that have to underpin everything um, that we're doing. So all of this is top of mind for me, and I want to just maybe end with two comments. I want to keep us uh, rolling on time here this morning, and I'll, I'll, I'm looking forward to spending a little bit more time with you this afternoon. Um, the digital agenda is one that we all share, and I encourage you very much uh, over the next day or so to really press thinkings and to learn from one another. There's two other things that, you know, this, uh, this event is in the backdrop of. So October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, at least here in Canada. And so I'm just going to encourage you to think about over the next couple of days, what's one thing you can learn about security as a digital um, leader, because that is a team sport. And so I encourage you to um, kind of keep cyber security in the back of your mind. The other thing, um, related but not related, it is um, Mental Health Month as well. And so as leaders, uh, very much our job to ensure that we are having those conversations in our workplace in the, I don't know what it's like in your organization, but I know in the Government of Canada, uh, workload is extreme. Uh, it has been going on for quite some time. Uh, we have been dealing with people working from audience for joining. We are absolutely delighted to be hosting on in Ottawa today. The weather's always like this. It's 
we, uh, I was walking over from the office and I'm like, my goodness, we, it's like a chamber of commerce kind of day out there today. It's blue sky, the parliament, the leaves are just trying to turn. It's always like this here. So for those of you that are interested in coming to work in Ottawa for the federal government, we're hiring. Thank you. So much, Catherine. And um, as Catherine said, thank you for keeping us to time already. But you will be with us again this afternoon. And at that point, there'll be an opportunity to take some questions uh, from the audience. Um, I'm just, could somebody bring up the clicker, please? Oh, you've got it, Kevin, thank you. So I'm delighted to welcome for our second keynote session, Kevin Cunnington, um, who is now a expert advisor for Global Government Forum. But many of you probably will know Kevin because previously he was the Director General uh, for Government Digital Service in the United Kingdom. So a big round of applause, please, for Kevin. make that noise when I sit down. <laughs> I said, so Kevin, um, yeah, obviously he will tell us a bit about his former uh, kind of career and uh, how, what got you here, but um, Kevin is advising Global Government Forum at the moment. So I just, I said I'd take this opportunity to just give you a little insight into areas where we can then help to provide thought leadership and training uh, for civil servants as well. So please do check out all of the things that we do. But we're so delighted that Kevin now has joined our team and um, has been doing some of that research and will tell us a bit today in particular about a significant report uh, that he was a key part of looking at digital leaders and the challenges facing digital leaders around the world. So do you just wanna tell us why we're so pleased to have you, why you're the perfect person to be doing this yep. and also maybe some of the highlights from that report. Yep. So uh, I've come with slides, knowing what the questions might be. Uh, that's me. Uh, that is actually me. That's my UK government profile. I realise you can't read it terribly well at the back, but it ostensibly says I ran GDS for three years, which was a real privilege. I was UK's digital envoy and got to do this all the time under UK government sponsorship for two years. And I've been doing this with GDS for a couple of years. So I'm not unique, but I am lucky Kevin. Uh, this is what we've been up to. So the graph or the world graph on the left shows all the countries we've spoken to over the last year. And on the right, we've laid out exactly what we've been up to. So we started just over a year ago. We had virtual workshops in those days with, well, you can read Scotland, Israel, Azerbaijan, a whole raft of leading nations really in the UN benchmarking. And in January of that year, we've published all those findings. And I'll talk in detail on the next slide about what those are. We've had a whole set of follow-ups from all the uh, issues the leading countries identified, starting with talking to the CEOs of the civil service in Singapore uh, and asking them what they're going to do about some of the problems they're creating for ETH to go through them. And I'm going to do this in about three. However, they are all online, so you can look it up. And if you're here tonight for the CDI, comment, uh, CDI Summit, I will be presenting them in detail. And again, tomorrow, this is exactly the agenda for what we're talking about. So briefly, vision and planning. Visions are largely irrelevant. Most of our visions are the same. We all talk about life events, digital identity, joined up services, better tools for civil servants. And the actual... Citizen digital identity is very polarizing. There are 197 countries in the world, 11 have digital identity at scale, 186 of us do not. If you have it, you can transform. If you don't, you can't, because you can't join up the data that we hold about people in different silos. So digital identity is probably the key technology topic within digital today. Uh, funding capital investment, let me characterise this as we gave you a lot of money five years ago, Kevin. We'd like to save all the money for climate change right now. It doesn't work like that. If you don't continue investing, you don't resolve the legacy issues that you've got. Uh, funding and procurement, treasuries around the world still see digital transformation as similar to building a bridge 
or a railway. It's not true of pretty much everybody else, but it is resolved in the top 10. So at least we know how to do that. Uh, and in the next slides, I'll talk about how to do that. Uh, lots of countries around the world, like the UK, have constrained pay for senior leaders. Let me characterize this. We can't pay you more than the Prime Minister, Kevin. Really? I used to be paid a lot more than the Prime Minister. And it's a real issue because it not only constrains the people you can recruit at the very top, but also the people you can recruit who work for you. And it's the greatest false economy in government. Paying people too little to do £100 million jobs is just the wrong economy, honestly. And then finally, good news, the CEOs agree with this at the conference. We still have a real issue right at the top with ministers and uh, senior, very senior civil servants, Herm Sex, CEO, <coughs> Deputy Minister types, not really understanding digital well enough, not feeling confident having the skill sets to help us drive transformation. Uh, and that's what we've Thanks. been up to. Thanks, Kevin. So really interesting. I think what you'll find today, a lot of those findings will be reflected in the panel sessions that we have. You'll get an opportunity to explore some of those themes. If anyone has the solution to recruitment, retention and paying people well in the public sector, that would be great if we could uh, solve that today. Uh, but Kevin, just moving on in terms of this research uh, from this report, but just your experiences of working in uh, the UK public mm -hmm. sector and talking to others, what would you advise people in terms of what are the common mistakes that people make and what would you be advising people not to do, but also to start doing? Yeah, so uh, in hindsight, and I say this is absolutely in hindsight because none of us got this right. It's obvious if you've got it but I've talked to a lot of governments whose national sites on Facebook, uh, and that really doesn't feel like the right answer to the problem. Uh, two, I banged on about citizen digital identity. I'll bang on a bit more about it. It's hugely polarizing. You need to get it right. Only 11 out of 197 countries, to my knowledge, have. If you're a country like Canada and the UK, where you don't have digital, uh, citizen identity in the first place, it turns out to be incredibly hard to get it right, but it is vital. Uh, and on the next slide, I'll explain what goes wrong when you don't. Uh, and then thirdly, you need to train all your people. So let me give you a very concrete example. When the UK started in 2013, we committed ourselves to developing 25 exemplars, which we did over a three year period from 2013 to 2016. In parallel, we built huge academies to retrain civil servants, and we retrained 5,000 civil servants in the course of uh, building those 25 services. 25 services over the first three years, 800 services over the next three. And one of the common conversations I keep having with emerging countries is they do the first 25, and then they say, how do I do more than 25 now? And the answer is, you've got to scale your training in parallel with your first implementations, that when you come out of it, you've got thousands more people who have got the skills ready to help you. So that's part one. A um, little bit more about account. And there's some usual culprits, births, marriages, deaths, driving licenses, passports. Let me just tell you how it goes wrong. So uh, we create a citizen service for driving licenses and a person applies for a driving license in their name with their date of birth and their address. Subsequent to that, they get married, and that might change their name, and it might well change their address. Subsequent to that, they apply for a passport in their new name with their new address. And then at some point, we try and reconcile the passport holder with their driving license. The people are smiling, so you've obviously got it. You can see what goes wrong. If you can't uniquely identify people, then you end up with silos of data about people that are terribly hard to reconcile. So it's really important you get digital identity or some form of data model that underpins what you're doing before you start building lots of applications. And if you're in a situation like the UK, with rather a lot of applications nowadays and no scaled system identity, you've created an enormous problem for yourself that will probably take a decade to unwind going forward. So one, uh, everybody's done it, but try not to start by building Try to start by getting digital identity and your data model right. Two, almost nobody did this. Assess your digital capability. So 
what do I mean? How many technologists, how many digital data and technologists are there in Canada? How many data scientists do you have in Canada? Anybody know? It's common across the world. Nobody knows, I think, apart from the UK. We've got 20. Get it done as soon as you can. Because only when you understand your capability will you understand what sort of a plan you can implement. The next thing that most of us didn't do was estimate the number of applications you'll need to develop. So uh, let me make this a quiz and uh, let me lay down the gauntlet because Iceland, two weeks ago, got this exactly right. So come on, Canada, here we go. Uh, in 2013, the UK estimated there were 650 central government applications we needed to build. This is before we started building, 650. Ten years later, oh sorry, so central government for us is things like education, tax, unemployment, like it is for you guys, but it does not include the NHS, which is a big bit of the UK. It does not include local and municipal services, so this is just central government. Nine years later, how many applications do you think we've implemented, implemented in the UK? Let me give you three choices. Number one. 500 or less, we're still working on it. Number two, exactly, 650. Number three, 7,672. More than 10 times our original estimate. So who's on option one, less than 500? Who's on option two, exactly, 650? Oh, one somebody put the hand up. One hand, two hands, three hands for that one. So we've got three hands for less than 500. 650, anybody? Go and go. have assessed your capability or figured people have got to do it. So if you've not done this, do it, because it gives you a real kind of sense check of whether it's even achievable. Thanks, Kevin. I'm just looking at the clock. I was hoping we could get in a couple of questions, but I think oh, what we'll do yeah. is you're back on stage later. Yeah. Um, so there'll be an opportunity to put questions to Kevin then. And also Kevin will be around all day, so you can definitely grab him out in the lobby as well. But just before we go, um, in terms of next steps then on this research and the report, what are the next steps and, and can people get involved in that in some way? Yeah, definitely. So in three minutes, according to the clock, <laughs> uh, one is uh, GGF, as Siobhan's alluded to and I've alluded to, is developing courses. One we're currently piloting is for permanent secretaries around the world because we do recognise, well, they're special, aren't they? The permanent secretaries who are here. Uh, two is a whole raft of we will be attending the summit tomorrow. That seven um, issues we identified really forms the backbone of the discussion. It's good to whinge about it, it's quite cathartic, but what are we gonna do to solve it? Uh, uh, three is, I'd like some help if countries are prepared to volunteer. 7,672, is, is that really the right number?
Director at the Digital Service in Germany. I think you might want to move yeah, chairs <laughs> just because you might get the microphones in the wrong order then. And then last, but no means least, hi Megan, we've got Megan Lee, who is Chief Strategy and Transformation Officer at the Government Central Digital and Data Office in the UK. Now this panel is all about, as you will see on there, the role of digital um, and data in policy making. So we'll be considering things like how best to integrate kind of um, the experts and the professions from digital and data so that that work gets really integrated into the policy making progress. We've asked our panelists to give some short opening remarks. And as I say, once we've heard from each of our panel members, we'll then come over to you in the audience for a conversation. So, Tila, over to you. Thank you so much. First of all, I, I'd like to say how it's a great pleasure to be here uh, in Canada, in the birthplace of ice hockey. As you know, all Finns loves ice hockey as well as I am. I'm, I think Mike my? is just taking his off. Okay. I think it might be off. I'm a, a great fan of Finnish team. Actually, myself, I'm a weightlifter. Ah. Actually, the uh, Finnish champion from this year wow. in my age and weight group. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but uh, ice hockey is, is lovely too. Yes, uh, and uh, I, I'm, um, I graduated uh, as a lawyer from uh, University of Lapland and I'm a little off because I'm so like enthusiastic to digital. Uh, important because in, in, in it's the rule of law that people can trust uh, that uh, their data is uh, and the information is, is uh, well shared. And finally, uh, you have to manage data. In Finland, uh, I'm very proud of our uh, government because uh, we have a ministerial working group which is like uh, managing and leading all the digitalization in Finland. And a uh, and, uh, few years ago, uh, we got uh, information, uh, information, what it is, uh, guide, policy guidelines to the parliament. So it's the highest level. You have to like be aware about what, to, what is going to, on to the digitalization. And uh, I heard yes week, uh, last week that the uh, first thing this ministerial working group made, they explored or, uh, about cyber security things all over the government and, and authorities. And that's very, very important point also. For me, I report to my, my minister uh, very quickly, and though, and we have uh, uh, laws in Parliament how to like uh, uh, make.
things happen, yeah. like to open the data, and that, that's all. So the managing of data is important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tila. I, I think you set the bar there in terms of your personal story about being the... Um have information systems that are going to detect and correct those. Um, I would say that the way ministers think about digital government, which has been an ongoing journey, certainly goes back to uh, on, you know, government online and the internet and other waves of technological change, is that um, the way they, th they, they think about these issues um, uh, varies enormously. It's not uniform. Um, transactional services, which is the language we tend to go to quickly, are the easy part. <laughs> Politicians want transactional services to work. The feedback of voters is, is instant for them, and they will. All, you're pushing on an open door uh, when you're trying to to, uh, to convince them to do something about externally facing transactional services. It is a factor of ten harder to get them interested in internal services, what I like to call G to G government services that are behind and make all of those external services possible. They are still treated, uh, both by ministers and within government, as overhead, uh, as Kevin referred to. Uh, they are not thought of consistently as investment or recapitalization. They are extremely vulnerable every time there is a spending review or a dialing back of resources. And a factor of 10 even harder than that is to get anybody to care about the management of text-based records. Uh, please do what you can to support Catherine in her agenda. Records management is a shambles in Canada. I'm sure it is in other places. And investment in legacy records is, is the least likely place that ministers are going to go to for investment and decisions. Um, the most important decisions governments take are allocative. Where are they going to put money? Where are they going to put people? Where are they going to put fewer humans? So we're going to go back to concepts around productivity and workflows and value added of the humans in our organization. Do we have the digital tools that are going to be able to do the work with, with fewer people? And that, that's inevitably coming to Canada, as it will, I think, to other countries. Um, I often get asked where policy comes from. And, um, you know, the, the sort of flow of it, in my experience, is that there's sort of two kinds of information go to decision makers, the, the women and men that we, we, we choose to make these kind of decisions. The biggest one is actually a feedback loop on past policy changes, past programs. Are they working? How are they doing? Where are they broken down? Where are they falling short? Where are they succeeding? And the other is input uh, around new things, truly new things that could be done to, to respond to issues out there. So digital government has to, com to be fully effective, has to connect to the feedback community, which is in Canada larger than the input community. There are a dozen institutions built for feedback, which is a good thing. Officers of Parliament, agents of Parliament, staff of parliamentary committees, a community of evaluators, a community of auditors, professional development communities around, around those people that do feedback. 
they are not well connected to digital government and all of those efforts that were on, on Kevin's bubbles have to be applied okay. to the feedback communities with um, I would say that um, it's important to uh, understand the way that the ministers important think to about these issues and the sense that, that yes, that, 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 les risques autour de la vie privée et la cybersécurité et l'interférence à l'étranger, ce sont les choses que les gouvernements doivent considérer et donc on doit les amener dans la fabrication du design. Le travail est difficile autour de la sécurité et les, co les contrôles à, à l'interne et euh, la conformité des données, doivent, on doit pouvoir accéder à des protocoles et tout. Ce sont de vrais risques dans une société démocratique sous euh, la loi mondiale. C'est du travail assez difficile. Donc, et je sais que ça s'en vient plus tard aujourd'hui, mais soyez vigoureux à considérer les données biaisées. Qui n'est pas capturé par euh, vos euh, sets de données? Soyez au courant euh, de, des, des évidences. Euh, l'information biaisée. Les gens vont voir ce qu'ils veulent voir parce que ça va is, uh, ressortir dans plusieurs exemples aujourd'hui. Ce serait qu'on pourrait avoir une conférence entière au Canada à propos du fédéralisme d'un gouvernement numérique et on, comme on a vu cette semaine avec les élections au Québec et avec le gouvernement en Alberta, on n'a pas besoin de rappel, mais tout ce qui est significatif au Canada implique des fois deux et trois niveaux du gouvernement. Quand on réfléchit au changement climatique et les soins de santé et les réconciliations avec les Premières Nations et euh, les mesures de COVID, etc., etc. Donc, ce que le gouvernement fait avec ça, ça rend que les facteurs sont plus difficiles. Et ça ne veut pas dire qu'on peut point de parler un peu moins rapidement. Alors, là où les ministres sont concernés, ils ne considèrent pas nécessairement à quoi réfléchissent les politiciens. C'est drôle que vous dites aussi qu'ils ont peur de, des échecs des données ou de ne pas bien réussir. Et aussi à propos du besoin que quand les ressources sont plus serrées et là où ils se virent autour du monde pour faire un cas pour l'investissement. Donc, il y a beaucoup d'impact sur ce que vous avez dit. Merci beaucoup. Christina, je vous donne le micro. Et donc, je peux suivre ce que Michael a dit avec un exemple bien concret en Allemagne. Je suis très heureuse de savoir ce que vous avez fait. Au sein du gouvernement fédéral, il est important de noter que afin de proposer des services digitaux, nous avons besoin de législation numérisée, nous avons besoin d'expertise de, donnée. Maintenant, concernant euh, la conception des services, afin de faire face euh, éventuellement aux écarts et de pouvoir euh, avoir euh, une transformation des données en processus effectifs et notamment le réglage.
We put the conditions in place for government, uh, for digital transformation of government strategy. And, and the creation of CDDO was a real, an opportunity for us to sit back and say, and the scheme, which was built during the pandemic, was a joint venture between Treasury and HMRC. Uh, and it, one of the most sort of ambitious economic interventions in the UK's history. And it was stood up in four weeks by a digital team. I'm sure you had many, many instances in, during the, COVID, uh, the pandemic of, of doing similar uh, brilliant feats through digital. Um, but then at the same time, we have some really old services in government. We have some services that uh, require people to print off forms, over 6,000 actually, on gov.uk, which means people need a printer. I mean, I don't know if you have a printer at home, but I don't. Um, and so those that are really in need that, that are coming to the government to, to get, uh, to access services really struggle. Uh, and so we looked at, we, we sort of took a step back and, and that sort of same.
autorisation. C'est beaucoup plus facile pour le, la fonction publique. Donc, il y a un moment à capturer. Sur... Christine, est-ce que vous pensez qu'il y a eu ce changement en Allemagne J'ai envie de... universities, courts, um, you know, the, those kinds of things have guilds, they have unions, they have yeah. points of resistance and so on. And we saw um, people just thinking about problems in new ways, like, you know, why do I have to print out a form? Why do I have to go in person and do this? I guess, the, I mean, you know, the other point is some of this is just inevitable. Uh, that <laughs> Uh, these people are humans, that was kind of my first point, and, you know, we learn from our own experience, renewing our driver's license, uh, dealing with my mother's experience in the healthcare system, my kids' experience in the education system, how difficult or easy it was for me to set up. In the last few months, though, we've also had uh, the lying in state of Her Majesty the Queen and the state funeral. Uh, we've had a, a budget, a fiscal event, to respond to the energy crisis oh, that I you mentioned notice. earlier. <laughs> um, there is always another crisis is how it feels like in government and and I think you know something we do well is respond in a crisis and you know mobilize resource and capability and 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 focus and we deliver um, and I think that the COVID did teach us a number of things I think there are three enduring benefits one is the expectation of ministers and senior leaders that data be used on a daily basis mm. to inform decisions uh, which is obviously hugely uh, valuable and has enabled us to uh, to to build on that. We've we've launched a data masterclass where our civil servants and our ministers, many of our ministers, have now taken it to understand how to lead organisations better using data. The second change is is the pace and the expectations around pace of of standing up new services. It, most of our services were stood up in weeks during the pandemic. It used to be months, and that. Uh, that has been a huge sort of um, a huge branding in, uh, advantage for us in the digital function as to the art of the possible. And I think the third the third piece is around um, we, we you know we we are using data more. We're also you know, building services more quickly. But what what these crises have shown us is the need to work across departments much more effectively. Yeah. And I think there we've we had some brilliant examples during the pandemic of sharing data, for instance, between uh, HMRC and the NHS, which enabled us to identify uh, work addressing that. Has it fixed a lot of our services at, at the moment? For instance, that child benefit service that I spoke about? Absolutely not. So I think um, there are certainly lessons we can take. But what we're very much focused on is, is actually not about those pockets of progress, and not about those examples of where we've, we've uh, risen up in times of crisis and delivered. But how do we achieve that enduring transformation to the way that we do business as government, the way we deliver policy, the half a million people that work for us as an, as an employer, and, and the seven and a half thousand services we deliver to, to the public? Thanks. OK, so we had two questions. Do you want to just put your hand up so I can see? Thank you. The lady there. Thank you. I'll come to you in the blue <laughs> shirt first, and then the lady, the lady in front second. We'll take two questions together. Thank you. Um, Dr. Leanne Hawkins, Looking Local, who are UK local government run provider of digital services. With the implementation of digital services comes the need to consider data protection. 
One of the culture shifts that I'm currently working on with the UK public sector is to push the implementation of data protection by design, which means ensuring that data protection is considered right at the start of implementing services, systems, products and processes. That brings huge burdens on information government teams and so they become a bottleneck to progress. One of the changes we're pushing forward is to empower the wider organisation to take more responsibility for their own data protection obligations. For example, working with the Metropolitan Police Force, they started with 190 processes which didn't have data protection. de comprendre qu'il faut avoir des solutions, de comprendre qu'il faut avoir des solutions numérisées, centralisées, standardisées pour nous protéger. Je pense qu'il n'est pas réaliste de penser que voir que les 300 organisations du gouvernement canadien pourraient avoir des ressources euh, chacune de leur côté. Nous devons euh, avoir créé de manière globale un environnement sécurisé. Sinon, nous allons avoir un véritable problème. Donc, c'est la réalité de la cybersécurité. Très important de pouvoir construire sur la confiance que doivent inspirer les hommes politiques. Maintenant, travailler sur un partage d'informations transgouvernementales, partager ce qui doit l'être. Maintenant, concernant les hommes politiques, la bonne politique, la bonne initiative, c'est ce pourquoi nous euh, élisons les hommes politiques. Tant qu'ils ont des bonnes informations concernant leurs actions, il faut respecter le processus démocratique. Mais il faut également comprendre qu'il y a des euh, biais et des filtres et également l'action des médias sociaux. Merci, Michael. Megan, très rapidement, concernant ces deux questions, et je vais en prendre une question pour nos collègues des départements de gestion de données, également dans d'autres domaines, notamment la décision politique, mais c'est très important. Et pour moi, comme Christine l'a souligné, ce n'est pas simplement le fait d'avoir ces principes, mais également de les englober dans une véritable culture de gouvernement. C'est une législation et si nous n'avons pas de loi commune, je ne sais pas comment est-ce que cela va fonctionner. Je ne sais pas comment cela fonctionne au Canada, mais c'est le cas pour nous. En termes de données publiques, tout doit être écrit dans une loi et ainsi le Parlement a décidé qu'il en serait. Paragraphes, but, uh, that's 
that's transparent and uh, everybody can trust that that uh, uh, data, uh, personal uh, data is, is in register now. Uh, about this, um, if you don't, like the other question, the citizen, yeah, yeah. I, I believe in service design and uh, like uh, co-creating and that kind of thing. It, it takes also times, yeah. it, it uh, needs work, but, but I think that is the very good path. I'm sure that will on. come up in other sessions we're having about kind of AI and digital IDs, for example, the importance of co-creation with uh, citizens yeah. as well. So we've got time very quickly. I know we are now standing between you and coffee. We've got time for say two more questions. So there's a person there. Thank you very much. And then does anybody else want to add another question? We didn't mention it a lot, so that would definitely come up uh, throughout the rest of the day as well. Michael, you're nodding. Let's go first on ethics. Well, I won't speak to current Canadian experience, but I, I know that there are a lot of international conversations. I'll put in a plug for Global Government Forum uh, as it organized conversations on this. And there is a group of digital countries. It was six, then it was nine, then it was 12. Uh, particularly the ethics around software, predictive technologies, AI, um, you know, uh, are, are very important. And, and it there are all kinds of issues there about systemic racism and gender bias and, uh, and exclusion and uh, any number of, of, of ethics. So um, again, the thing about AI is not the technology, it's the humans, and it's very much the governance and the ethics, which is gonna determine whether these are trusted tools of democratic governance or the tools of authoritarian government. Thanks, Michael. Tula, what's happening on ethics in Finland? Uh, well, that, that is very important thing. And, uh, Again, uh, an example from Finland, we had a great discussion about uh, can we make uh, like tax, tax decisions automatically and uh, well actually we didn't, we couldn't, but now there will be a law <laughs> about that and it's like very narrow things you can do automatically and AE is totally like the next step but uh, robotics and automatics, uh, yeah, it is a uh, discussion about that and um, that also must be transparent. Yeah, a big conversation mm. going on. Megan.